So uh, in the last session and in the, in the last segment of this study, we're talking about the principles of holiness, the principles of holiness, uh, the internals and the, uh, the theological basis for, uh, for holiness. And we've, def we've defined holiness in every one of these studies thus far. So we won't go back and do definitions uh, on that again. Simply uh, go back and reference some of those early, uh, earlier studies on, on, on this section or in this section. Today, uh, in this study, what we'll do is we'll get into the practical application part. Um, and we've, in the last study, established uh, redundantly the idea of what you do uh, determines your status in the kingdom of God. Uh, it is it is true, it's what's in your heart, it's true, it's what's in your mind because those things are demonstrated or, or uh, betrayed by what you, what you literally do. Uh, but uh, most of this commentary is, um, is an approach to dispel you of uh, your Protestant framing the idea that all you have to do to be saved is believe in your heart or accept Jesus as your personal savior, that's not demonstrated anywhere in the word of God. But you have to come into the covenant relationship which has some very clear indications what obedience is to the New Testament, the gospel, the covenant, uh, repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, evidence by speaking in other tongues. Um, those are unassailable. Those are undeniable biblical presentations. You have to do, uh, you have to do uh, theological contortions to set those things aside. That is the testimony of the, the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. So we won't go back and recreate all of those, um, all of those conversations. But we will right now get into practical applications. We'll start with what you say. So let's, uh, let's start here. Um, this is not a study to any particular individual. Uh, usually our Bible studies are. We have a student in the room with us and the student is reading or the family is here and the family takes turns reading. But, but when, when you just have me and we're in this uh, COVID presentation here, you are, uh, you, <laughs> you're, you just have to listen and I blather on and do all the reading and everything. So uh, it's a lot more fun when we're together doing the Bible study, but this is as good as it gets right now. So, so anyway, uh, I'm glad that you've joined. It's for whomsoever will. And let's, let's see if we can't prosper in the word of God today. Mighty God, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for the privilege of handling your word together. We thank you for these that have joined. We pray your blessing on their home, their family, their work, their ministry. And we pray, oh God, that you would help us to study and to understand your word today. Lead us and guide us into truth and into understanding. And we pray that you would do it in the name above every name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. All right. So... Uh, in our practical application here, if you were sitting here with me, you would see that we start with what you say. What you say uh, then becomes a really important feature in the conversation of holiness, right? So uh, let's start in uh, Proverbs. Uh, let's start in Proverbs chapter uh, 18 and verse 21. Um, so like early on in the chapter, verse four, the words of a man's mouth are as deep waters. Verse six, a fool's lips enter into contention for his mouth calls for strokes. Verse seven. A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. Verse eight, the words of a talebearer are his wounds and they go down to the innermost parts of the belly. Verse 21, 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So we have a, a, a lot of indication here early on in the word of God that uh, the uh, words in verse four are as deep waters. So they indicate, they indicate what is down inside the person and they carry a great deal of, of gravity. Verse six, uh, a fool's lips enter into contention. So quite often before there's ever a, a physical confrontation, there is a verbal confrontation and uh, a fool's mouth is his destruction. Well, that's interesting. It's like, I thought what he did would be uh, his destruction, but his lips are the snare of his soul and the words of a talebearer are his wounds. So these are different looks at the, uh, the gravity of the spoken word. And when you consider it, you have to, you have to understand that the first encounter we have with God is in Genesis one, it's the moving of the spirit and then God speaks and God says, and it is a creative word. <laughs> it is truth, it is God's word, and it brings forth light out of darkness. And God is good and God is love. And you know, all of the, all of the wonderful things about God, He's the father of lights above in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning and from whom comes every good and every perfect gift. God is uh, speaking and his, and his language, his word is logos. It is the creative word of God. Now, we are made in God's image. It's very clear in the study of the word of God that Man has been given the power to speak and, and has been given dominion and creative power in speech, right? And most everything that is begins with first an idea and then that idea is brought into reality probably first by the spoken word, right? And it has great, great power in the positive and in the uh, creative, but it also has, whenever you have power like that, it's a double-edged sword. It swings in both directions. And so if you have power, when you are in a place where you have no power, you have very little effect, good or bad. But when you're in a place where you have great power, the small things that you do can affect for good or for evil. Right, and so man has been, God has invested in mankind the power of word and the power of prophecy. And those things have tremendous power. So the, the writer of Proverbs here, uh, the words are as deep waters and it is directive. It controls the direction of a life and outcomes in that person's life. And then, Verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, let me say at the onset that this is within the parameters of the context of the word of God, right? Um, right? So if you have great power in what you say, but it is conditioned by the uh, existent structure of the word of God, which simply means uh, you can say, um, I will be, and that's the beginning of a journey in that direction, right? So you have, you have creative power, you have deterministic power. Typically it begins with, it's like the, the little train that we heard about when we were children. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And, uh, <clears throat> and so he, he does. And so the spoken word then is the uh, unveiling of will and purpose and desire, and it tends to be deterministic and creative. And so there is, there's great power in spoken word, but, uh, and there's power to do good and to do evil, right? So, but to set some boundaries on that, uh, 
you cannot stand and in defiance of the framework of the word of God and speak something and countermand the word of God. For example, uh, you can't live outside the covenant restrictions of the word of God and demand the blessings of God because that's not going to happen. I, I prophesy that I'm going to be blessed. <laughs> well, you can prophesy all you want about being blessed, but if you're living outside the framework of the word of God, then you have to understand, go back and read Deuteronomy 28, and you'll understand that the blessings come by observance and obedience to the word of God. And uh, disobedience and failure to observe the word of God results in that same chapter in curses, right? So you can howl and speak all you want, but, uh, what you do is going to determine in compliance with the word of God is going to determine what you, what you receive. All right. So we want to establish the power of the tongue here, but not inordinately. We don't want to give it power that it doesn't have. For example, uh, if you are physiologically and biologically a man, you can't by power of your expression determine that you're going to be a woman today. Now that's not a very PC thing to say, but I'm gonna say that uh, you outside the, the, uh, the definitions of the established word of God, you can't change that by what you say. Even if you go and have a surgery, you're still a man, right? Uh, even if society tells you, well, okay, we'll let you be a girl today. You can't, you're a man. And if you're a woman, you can't say, I am a man. You can't change the fundamental truth of the word of God by what you say, all right? So we're going to accord your tongue power. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. We're going to accord it the power that is given it by the word of God, but we're not going to accord it power that it does not have, right? And you can't, you can't proclaim something to be that is in opposition to the word of God and make it true by speaking it. All right, so we wanted to establish that first. All right, and uh, and now we're gonna uh, and now we're gonna pursue it. But but death and life are in the power of the tongue. To within the housing, within the framework of the Word of God, what you say then becomes very very important. All right, so let's look at um, let's look at Matthew chapter twelve. And um, let's start with verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. All right. Uh, so what is, he says they're evil. Well, what, how do you arrive at that? Define that term. Well, evil then is defined by the word of God as maybe what is contrary to the word of God, what is antithetical to the kingdom of God. And so he says, you're, you're evil. How can you speak good things? All right. And uh, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I, you remember David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So we condition our heart by the word of God and by the kingdom of God, and then our mouth speaks from the abundance of our heart. So how, how, do, I, how do I control my mouth so that it speaks in accordance with the word of God, which is, you know, our, our covering conversation today is about holiness. So how do I bring my mouth into the realm of holiness and speak things that are congruent with, with holiness. Well, the first thing I do is I fill my heart with the word of God. I fill my heart with the spirit of God. Your heart biblically is your spirit, right? So I fill myself with the things of God, the spirit of God in prayer and in worship, the word of God in study and meditation. And, uh, and so when I do, if I fill my life with primetime television and the buzz at the work, at the workplace, on the job, if I <laughs> am involved in the culture of the party and the bar 
uh, if I am a sports fanatic and I fill my life with sports commentary and uh, attendance of things that are, that are all about sports, well, that's what my mouth speaks. That's what I say. And, uh, and, and it, you know, what you love and what you fill your life with, well, that's what you talk about. And it's, it's, it's an old and uh, well-recognized uh, uh, point of relational dynamic that if you want to get close to somebody, you let them talk about what they love. You talk to them about something that is important to them. And, uh, and so this, this then uh, is, a, is an understanding of the fact that what your life is full of is what you speak. Now, I want to extend that a little bit and say that this is sort of a reciprocal type of arrangements. Not only is your mouth speaking what your heart is full of, but what your mouth speaks is what your heart becomes full of, right? So your heart affects your speech, but your speech affects your heart, right? So if I want to fill my heart, again, it's back to that conversation from previous studies about renewing your mind, changing your knowledge base. Well, you can change what's inside of you uh, by changing what you say with your mouth, right? So you can begin to agree with God. You have to find it. You have to understand what the word of God says, but then you begin to articulate what God has said and you begin to speak the things. What was the difference between Joshua and Caleb and the 10 spies that were unbelievers? What was the basic difference? It was what they said. The 10 spies that went into Canaan with Josh and Caleb all came out and said, yep, it's just like God said, it's in a land of outrageous abundance and it's milk and honey, and look, here's a cluster of grapes. It takes two of us to carry them out. But they said there are giants there, there are, there are fierce people there, there are walled cities there. We cannot take it. We are like ants in our own sight. But Joshua and Caleb uh, said, no, we can take it. God is with us. We can go right now. And God heard what they said, and the people begin to say what the 10 spies, unbelieving spies said. And based on what they said, God cursed them to wander in the wilderness until they died. They spoke and it was prophetic. They spoke and it was deterministic. They spoke and because of what they said, they wandered in the wilderness. They wanted to go into the land the very next day, but God told them you can't go now because of what they had said. So there are a lot of uh, moving parts to this. What you say is uh, to a degree deterministic. It is prophetic and God hears what you say and God will conduct business with, with you based on what you say. Faith is expressed by your lips. Josh and Caleb live through the wilderness wandering. They outlive all of the unbelieving generation and Joshua is the leader after the death of Moses and Caleb at 80 receives his inheritance and he's just as strong as he was at 40. God pre uh, preserves them, God sustains them, God respects them and honors their word of faith and God brings them into promise and the difference was what they said. Now that's a really important thing. Uh, it's not only what you say, Again, don't give inordinate importance to that, but understand that it's part of a package, what you say and what you do, right? And so here, the mouth speaks the abundance of the heart. And so if I want to, if I want to, um, uh, if I want to condition my speech, I take, take pains, take uh, measures to fill my life full of the good things of God. So then, I wanna be around people that are saying the right things, right? Because you tend to, by osmosis and by experience, you tend to absorb uh, the spirit and the discussion of the people where with, you, uh, with whom you fellowship, right? So you wanna surround your people, your, yourself with people that are saying the right things, the biblical things, the godly things. You want to remove yourself from people that are saying the wrong things 
the, the ungodly things like. And so you probably want to, uh, you probably want to uh, unplug your television and uh, remove the movies uh, that are in your life that are projecting culture into your life that are filling your heart with things because your mouth is going to be affected by those things. So the influences in your life are something you have to consider. Now, back to one of the definitive points of, uh, of holiness, it has to do with proximity to God and by nature, as you draw close to God, you separate from your world. Well, in this discussion of it's important what I say with my mouth, then it's important what's in my heart because that conditions what comes out of my mouth. Then I want to draw close to God, which means I'm going to spend time with godly people and I'm going to spend time in godly environments and I'm going to spend time in the word of God and in conversation with God. Well, that's, that's a sea change of behavior. That's a sea change of behavior. Uh, there, there's a finite number of hours in the day, and if I take time for the Word of God, time for fellowship with godly people, time for worshiping God in the house of God, and, uh, and time for prayer, I'm in the presence of God, well, I have, uh, I have less time for Jane and Joe who are down the street who are not living for God. I have less time for a television uh, and, and TV is just kind of an old idea now. It's, uh, it's on your phone. It's everywhere. Oh, it lit up when I picked it up. Uh, it's, it's everywhere uh, you go. And so you want to, uh, you want to change your, uh, your environment so that what comes into your life system, into your mind and into your spirit, uh, which both of those are going to affect the way that you speak and the way you speak is going to affect the way your relationship with God goes. Like what shaped Caleb and what shaped Joshua so that they stood at the same place the 10 spies stood and they said things that brought them into promise and they said things that kept them alive and they said things that God heard and it pleased God and all of those work toward positive outcomes in their lives. And the 10 spies said things that God heard and he was displeased. They said things that were deterministic in keeping them from crossing over and possessing the promise of God. And so in that case, you back up a, a step in the process and you say, what framed Joshua? What framed Caleb? What framed the fearful and the unbelieving? And you have to uh, make an assumption there that there are influences in Joshua's life that influenced him toward faith. There were influences in Caleb's life that influenced him toward courage. There were influences in the others, and, and we don't know their names. I mean, they're there in the word of God, but nobody names their kids after them and nobody remembers them because they are unbelievers and failures and they died in the wilderness. And who wants to name their child? Oh, great, I'm gonna name you after so-and-so who was one of the unbelieving 10 spies that uh, died in uh, an ignominious death in the desert because of unbelief. That's what I want my kid to be. <laughs> do, do you understand that that's an expression of your mouth and an expression of your hope and an expression of your, anyway. We don't know, we don't know these 10 guys, but they were framed up by something that didn't work to their, to their eventual success in the kingdom of God. So then as we back up from the moment where just freeze frame them, the 10 standing here, Joshua and Caleb standing here, freeze them right there. They're about to speak and seal their destiny by what they say, right? So back up frames before and spend time with them in their tent, spend time with them in their social interaction, spend time with them and see what has framed them and brought them to that moment. I'm gonna to suggest to you that we are creatures of our familial influence and our socio-cultural influence 
And so those are the primary things until we are of age to make decisions about, all right, now I'm going to the books I read, the people I meet, the activities that I'm involved in, those things all serve to influence me in some way. Birds of a feather, finish it. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I want to read things that are going to build me and challenge me to be a better person in the kingdom of God. I want to spend my time in activities that are gonna build me and encourage me and, uh, and challenge me to be a better person and to reflect the word and the kingdom of God. And so, so in this early discussion, knowing that life and death are in the power of the tongue and that, well, let's read on here, a good man out of the good treasure, I'm in verse 35 of Matthew 12, out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. What you fill yourself with is what comes out. Garbage in, garbage out. That's an ancient, like 1980s uh, uh, computer maxim or axiom. Uh, <laughs> But if you put garbage into your life, garbage is gonna come out of your life. And so it's important now that I condition what my mouth is going to say. And that's gonna be conditioned by familial influence. So when Jesus in Luke 14 says, if you wanna be my disciple, you gotta hate your mama and your daddy and your brother and your sister and uh, yeah, even your own life. What does he mean? Well, we've done this, we'll, we'll do it again. If mama is cussing and fussing and negative and destructive and critical, well, mama's not going to comport very well with the things of God. And if you love mama and mama is an influencer in your life, then Jesus said, you got to part ways. Now, once you get your head screwed on straight, you can go back and try to evangelize mama. But if she stays dominant in your life, you will not have success in the kingdom of God. The same for daddy, the same for brother, the same for sister. And if you love your own life, who you are right now, more than you love the kingdom of God, then you're not gonna have success in the kingdom. So Luke 14, separate from familial influence that is antithetical to the word of God. Uh, maybe there'll be a season when you can go back and influence them. You can't help loving them, right? Right? But you ought to be able to recognize them when you begin to look at the word of God, you've got to recognize, oh, well, they don't, they don't think like God thinks. And, they, and every time you're in that environment, it reinforces all that you've been and all the framing and the strongholds. It reinforces them again and it's harder to overcome them and get them out. And every day you spend in that Egyptian influence or that ungodly influence uh, is a day lost in your progress in the kingdom of God. And you won't, you're finite. You only have a certain number of days. So you have to get after this business of finding yourself in the kingdom of God. So, uh, so withdraw from familial influence that affects the condition of your heart, that affects the creative or destructive power of your tongue, life and death in the power of your tongue. And beyond that, verse 36, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account for in the day of judgment. And here's the bottom line, verse 37, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. All right? so. That is absolutely true in that story of Joshua and Caleb in the 10. And you can find other biblical places because the, the words of the mouth comports with the condition of the heart and they tend to be one and the same, right? So I have to withdraw from familial influences that will perpetuate the, uh, the, the worldly or the ungodly uh, condition of my heart, which causes me to stand with the 10 unbelieving and say, we can't take the promise of God. We can't go into the kingdom of God. There's too many things in the way. There are giants in the land. Oh, you know, and so 
I mean, it's like waking up in the morning for crying out loud and griping about the rain. Oh no, it's raining. Well, who did you think sent the rain? I mean, that's just basic living for God 101. Get up in the morning, quote Psalms 118. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The first thing I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna agree with God. This is a beautiful sunny day. I love it. This is a day that's hot as blazes. I love it. This is a day so cold that we're all gonna tremble and, and, <laughs> and suffer. I love it because God chose the day. God made the day. My goodness, that is just infantile, beginning level living for God. You have to agree. If you can't get past that, you're never going to live for God with any degree of success, griping and complaining about the day that God has given us. So let's start right there. Well, what is that? Well, that's a familial or a social, cultural um, influence that has that has framed you to be a griper and a complainer well they murmured in the wilderness and the bible said and god heard them and god was displeased with them and uh, on on a number of because they were griping about the conditions they were griping about the manna they were griping about the <laughs> the phenomenal deliverance that God had given. They weren't standing around talking about, wow, I still can't believe how God destroyed Egypt and crushed Pharaoh. I can't, I still can't believe what he did. He spread wide the Red Sea. We walked across and, and they wake up every morning. They throw back the tent flap and they see a giant tower of cloud and fire that walks with them through the wilderness. And they don't open up the tent every day and go, wow, look at this. God is with us. God is overshadowing us. I mean, we're talking about life and death and the power of the tongue and holiness. The words of your mouth having to do with your journey into holiness and your, and your journey into the kingdom of God. So holy is say what God says. Talk like God. Speak like the word of God. God is incurably optimistic. God is merciful. God is kind. God is good. God reigns on the just and the unjust. He, he shines his sun on the just and the unjust. Get the picture of God. Let your mouth reflect how God sees the world and sees his creation. <coughs> And uh, when God is creating, he said, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, it's an amazing thing when you begin to walk with God and it changes the way you see your world and the way you talk about your world and people in it. All right. So you have to shrug off the familial framing. You have to shrug off the socio-cultural framing and take on biblical framing, right? Godly framing or holy framing. And then it affects the way that you talk. You will be positive. You will be encouraging. You will be optimistic or faithful if you would. You will be <laughs> complimentary. Kindness comes out of your mouth. Uh, so many biblical things, traits, qualities will, uh, will develop in your life and they'll all be evident to you and to people around you and to your God because of what comes out of your mouth. Israel was a miserable crowd of murmurs and gripers and complainers and they didn't go into the promise of God. Think about it, all right? So you, you juxtapose that with Paul and Silas. Midnight, they're beaten, they're chained, and they're praising and singing praises unto God. And God says, man, I really like that. And he starts patting his foot with what they're singing. 
And when God pats his foot, the whole world starts shaking. And it's the weirdest earthquake in the world because it unlocked the chains on people's hands and unlocked the doors of their cells. Um, life and death, miracles, provision, so many things come out of your mouth that God then says, hey, I hear them. I want to, I want to be a part of that. I want to, uh, I want to uh, add my voice to their voice and I want to be a, I want to be a part of what they're, what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> I love this. I love this passage. Uh, I'm in Malachi chapter three and verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one another, one, one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him. But they that feared the Lord and thought upon his name, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I'll spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. They that, they that feared the Lord, that loved God, loved the things of God, they talked a lot about the things of God. They weren't, they weren't gossiping, they weren't complaining, they weren't murmuring, they weren't, they were, <laughs> they were talking about the things of God and uh, God heard it and God liked it and God said, they're gonna be mine. It's reminiscent of Israel in the wilderness. God heard it and God didn't like it and they never went into promise. So holiness at a very rudimentary level begins with what comes out of your mouth. Your journey into holiness begins to change what comes out of your mouth. Uh, one of the earliest, one of the pioneers in uh, the vast self-help industry was an old boy from uh, Yazoo, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Zig Ziglar, and uh, it's amazing, it is amazing. But he, the reason that he persisted and the reason that he was effective is that he utilized uh, biblical uh, ideologies. And he didn't label it biblical ideology, but it was the outgrowth of Judeo-Christian framing. And I can hear him saying, you can change who you are and you can change what you are by changing what goes into your mind. And he was all about what you say, right? So watch this, uh, the word of God, the most powerful thing in the earth, right? Well, maybe not because for whom does the word of God actually work benefit? Those who employ it, those who speak it, those who treasure it, right? So it takes the inaction or the activity of your will. Uh, you have to, you have to uh, participate in the word of God. You have to take it on. You have to hide it in your heart. You have to speak it with your mouth. Remember the lesson on temptation way back. And what did Jesus as a man in the earth do when he encountered the devil in Luke chapter four? It is written, it is written, it is said. Now I don't have to be the smartest guy in the world to understand if God on the earth in a body spoke the word of God when encountering the devil, then what do I do? I speak the word of God when I encounter the devil. Well, what does that say? Well, it simply says if I wanna be a person that is overcoming and pleasing to God and deterministic in a good way. I want to go into the promise of God. I want to take possession of the promise of God. Well, then I'm going to say what God says. And you can't improve on that. You can't improve on uh, people embellish on what God says, but it's hard to improve on a direct, direct quote from the word of God. So he confronts and defeats the devil at the level of pride, lust of the flesh and lust of the eye. He does that by the word of God in the wilderness. Now that is a remarkable instructional uh, passage for us so that we look at it and say, all right, I can determine my course 
and I can overcome the devil by what comes out of my mouth. And if what I say is uh, comportable to what God says, then I have, I have power in this uh, earthly arena. Let's, let's, look at, uh, let's look at James chapter three. And um, for in many things, we're in James three and two, for in many things we offend all, but if any man offend not in the word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. So if you want to control your whole life, the first place you start is where? It's the place where you engage your world at the most rudimentary level, right? It's the place you engage God at the most rudimentary level of faith, prayer, right? Prayer is breathing in and breathing out. Uh, prayer is the most essential expression of your faith, right? It's what you speak. It's, it's what you do with your mouth. Uh, so if you, can, if you can control your word, your mouth, you're a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. So if I want to get control over my whole life and determine the direction of my life, if I want to be Joshua and Caleb instead of the 10 losers that die in the wilderness, I, I have to control what I say. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. He said, we get, get that bit in their mouth, and we can make them go... And, and that horse weighs a lot more than that little kid or that young lady that's sitting, sitting in the saddle, but she can lead him. And once you train him, you train him with his mouth. The Bible says God will lead you by your eye or by the bit, you know? And you really want God to, to lead you with the, with the eye. He, he just points and you go. But that's another conversation. Uh, but your mouth then becomes like the controller for your body, for your life, right? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I believe this, I believe that, I like this, I like that, and you set direction. Behold also the, the ships which are, uh, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm or rudder, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. So the, the tongue is like the rudder on a ship, even though it's small compared to the ship, relative to the ship, it turns the ship. So is your tongue. You turn yourself back in the direction. Oh, were there no graves in Egypt? We told you, leave us in Egypt. And, uh, and, and I mean, that's, Israel's such a wonderful instructional uh, lesson to us because they, they, God gave them great deliverance and miracles after miracles. And they whined and moaned and complained and they set their own direction for destruction, right? So for you, you wanna change direction, you wanna to go toward uh, heaven and godliness and holiness, instead of hell and destruction and misery. Well, you do that with your tongue. You first start saying, I want to serve God. I want to live for God. I want to forgive my enemies. I want to be kind to people. I want, and whatever, fill in the blank with the biblical, the correct biblical response. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth and the tongue is a fire and a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. It defiles the whole body. Remember what Jesus said? You're gonna be condemned or you're gonna be, you're gonna be judged by what comes out of your mouth. And uh, so is the tongue among our members. It defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it's set on fire of God. For every kind of beast, birds, serpents, things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we do bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, 
these things ought not be. So, holiness. Uh, the tongue is deterministic. It is prophetic in that it directs and it, uh, it steers the body or the life toward. Uh, so every journey uh, begins with a voice, right? And so we, we create our directional dynamic with our tongue. But it's also an indicator. You listen to yourself. Someone else can listen to you. God can listen to you. Not very long at all. And we'll know what direction you're moving in by the words that you speak. How, I know how you feel about people by the words that you speak. I know how you feel about God and the kingdom of God and what God has required in his word by the words that you speak. I know how you feel about yourself by the words that you speak, right? And well, I mean, you know, people can say anything, but if you're around them a while, <clears throat> what they really believe will come out because the mouth speaks the abundance of the heart, right? And uh, so then the idea of what you say becomes a huge component of holiness. Holiness is kind. And so it doesn't speak destructive, uh, malignant, malevolent things. Uh, holiness is like God, it's love. And so it's encouraging and it's uh, uplifting and it's edifying. And uh, remember, uh, Paul, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouths, but those things that are good for edification, to edify the hearers thereof. And so speak no longer uh, lies, but speak truth, right? So what, what you speak is symptomatic of where your heart is. We're moving toward God, we're getting closer to God. Our tongue is going to reveal that. The things that we choose to talk about, the things that we choose to repeat, uh, the, the way that we deal with people. Uh, and so, so uh, familial uh, framing, I have to change that, I have to come out of that influence, sociocultural framing. So if this is going to be, we'll get into this later in other areas, but the music you listen to affects your speech. The movies you watch affect your speech. The television programming you watch affects your speech. The type of activities you're on, in, on your Facebook, your, your Instagram, your Twitterverse, <clears throat> all of that affects your speech. <clears throat> Those are new influences, they're socio-cultural uh, nonetheless, and they're just new ways of expressing that. People used to hang over the back fence of the house or down at the country corner store and be influenced by voices there and it would change their voice now it's technological, it's digitized, it's in your phone, it's, you know, your world is covered up by it, but you don't need to be participating in things that are not like God. Your mouth needs to be open for praise and for prayer and for the word of God and for encouragement. That is holiness. That is holiness. Holiness comes out of your mouth. Let me tell you something. You can have a long list of things you don't do, places you don't go. You can be, uh, you can wear a, a, a burqa and uh, be covered from your head to your toe and only we see your eyes. But if your mouth is full of malevolence and malignity and hatred and bigotry and trouble and fear and doubt and everything that's not like the kingdom of God, then you are speaking from a corrupt heart. And what we said early, dealing with the principles, you can get all the externals in place, but if you don't have it down on the inside, it's, uh, it's, it's not true holiness. It's not God's idea. 
The Pharisees looked really good on the outside. Jesus told them, he said, you guys are like whited sepulchers. You're like tombs. You're like graves. You look great on the outside, but on the inside, he said, you're full of dead men's bones. He could have said, you're full of rotting corpses. You're <laughs> so he wasn't, he wasn't decrying getting it right on the outside. You need to get it right on the outside. But the most important part is down inside. And if you get that right, your outside will get right, right? Okay. Hey, great to be with you this morning. And so we have, uh, we have uh, squandered another perfectly good hour. And uh, we, we only made one bullet point here. But what you say is so very important. I wanted to give it uh, due attention. We could spend more time, but we'll move on next time, which will be uh, maybe Saturday afternoon or a Monday morning. We'll work on what you see and then what you hear and where you go. And then we'll get into adornment and dress. Oh no, you're under the law. It's legalism. No, nah, it's Bible. It's what God wants. Do you really think it's a good idea to be down on the beach in your underwear and be a representative of the kingdom of God? <laughs> oh, the devil has taken you somewhere and you don't even know you're there. It's like the king's, the emperor's new clothes. He's parading down Main Street naked and everybody says, it's okay, it's okay. All right, I gotta quit. God bless you, so good to be with you. Lord bless all of these that are part of this study today. Prosper them in all they do today. Give them an outrageously beautiful, wonderful day with good outcomes and growth and strength in the kingdom of God. We pray that you would do it in the name above every name, in Jesus' name. All right, Lord bless.